Here we are. We're here. I'm so glad. Yeah. I know there's so many people that, man, they've just been waiting to hear from you. They just want to know how, how you're doing, yep. how, you know, family's doing. I mean, we've had Amy in a couple of times mm-hmm. to sort of give us updates along the way. But even as we were talking today, I was thinking, you know, you, you had a great point. Like some people are just catching the story right now. They know you've been gone. They don't really know the journey. Yeah. Um, why Tell us, let's do the physical journey. Let's talk about that. Sure. You know, um, I, I would like to say just very quickly to specifically um, the Newbridge family and the IHOP Atlanta family, just I don't know how to say thank you properly for the amount of uh, expressions and offers to help uh, over the last six months or so, probably four months. And um, thank you doesn't really convey how much our family appreciates it. There wasn't a whole lot practically that anybody could do, but what could be done was done well. And most of that while I was laid up and just as a husband and as a dad to say thank you to those who offered and those who uh, were, were able to come in and just serve our family in some pretty precious ways. That's one of the things about belonging to a spiritual family um, that you just can't be it. You, you, you can't. And, um, I'm, I'm so grateful. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, you know, for those that aren't aware back in October, I'm laughing. I'm just laughing because when I went and saw you a couple of weeks ago, you had all this food you were trying to offload to me because people had stacked you so high with so and much And I can't stuff. eat. <laughs> That's part of the problem. I'll explain that in the thing. It's like we had so much food, non-perishable goods, and I, we, we couldn't eat it all. And so I was trying to offload it to Billy. He's like, hey, man, take this home to your boys and, you know, riot. So, but just that's so typical of us as believers. We love through giving and doing whatever yeah. we can, and it was, uh, it was much love. And, but, um, you know, going back to October, I started experiencing some symptoms. For those that don't know the story, yeah, just, uh, just real briefly. And about October of last year, I started experiencing uh, on my right eye, it was just constantly crying, one eye just weeping. And you know, I wasn't sad or anything. It was just watering regularly. And then one day we were in your office, about six, seven of us. And as we're praying and just seeking the Lord, my eye just, it ballooned. And it, it looked like somebody had blackened my or puffed my eye. And so I went to the doctor for that and thinking it was pink eye and <clears throat> I looked hilarious. I remember. I was like, bro, <laughs> go get that thing checked out and don't, it's you like, don't have to hug me. Don't, don't come back. Don't, don't come back until you get that. <laughs> so we assumed it was pink eye, but it wasn't. And they couldn't figure out what it was. So they gave me you know, some medicinal drops and everything. And um, yeah, then it came back. At, we, yeah. knew, we knew nothing. We knew nothing. Point. And then it came back. And so I just kind of battled it with some eye drops. Uh, end of October through the middle of uh, November. And then our family went away for Thanksgiving and we were up in Tennessee and we were waiting to get into a restaurant or something. I was just rubbing my neck and all of a sudden I felt a contour in my neck mm-hmm. and um, recognized that, oh, there's something wrong. And so I l- had Amy look at it and she thought, well, you've been kind of sick. It's probably swollen lymph nodes, no biggie. So we just did our vacation. But when we got home, the thing just kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually uh, went to the doctor. Um, they did the biopsy. They did some scans. And of course, it came back as a malignancy, a tumor, uh, ended up being the size of a small grapefruit, large orange. And um, it was on my tonsil of all places. And so, uh, the devil. yeah, I mean, it was just, it was incredible. I was, you know, I'm 49 years old. We don't have any history of cancer in our family yeah. and it was just out of nowhere. And so, um, and then we started fighting. Yeah. And that's when we enlisted the body of Christ and we started praying and doing all the things that scripture teaches us to do. And, um, we, we have a part to play when a sickness or a disease hits, but ultimately, as we've prayed earlier tonight, we, we trust in the healing gift and power from the Lord. And so um, we did all of those things. And ultimately, you know, you, you, you don't lose. It's, it's not, a, I had some people and they mean well, they're like, no, Jeff, don't do radiation, don't do surgery, don't do chemo, don't do this. Just let's faith it out of there. And I'm like, Okay, um, I, I get what you're saying. I appreciate it. But at this point, you know, I don't feel like medicine is in conflict with trusting Jesus. The process right. didn't 
wasn't, I wasn't going to dictate to the Lord how he healed me. So they got it out, and then um, not too terribly long after that, they prescribed the treatment, and it blew me away. I, I really wasn't prepared for it. Um, they told me five days a week for six weeks radiation, it, at least two, if not three, session, sessions of chemotherapy. And I'll just be honest with you. I, I love the Lord. I thank the Lord for his goodness, and I trust him and have trusted him for 26 plus years. Um, but when they told me that I was going to do 30 consecutive rounds of radiation, and what I did not know in that moment is that radiation in the neck area produces some of the worst um, side effects. And when they started telling me what those side effects were going to be, it, it, it dinged me. It dinged me pretty hard. I, I was having a hard time processing. And um, so we did it, though. I mean, what are you going to do? You do what you're supposed to do. And so we went through all of that. Um, the end summarized. Let me condense all of this, because obviously on the back end of this now, I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah. And made it through the worst of it. I would say the entire process was easier than I thought, but the hardest week was 10 times worse than I thought it was going to be. It was after that second round of chemo, um, couldn't talk, couldn't produce words, and, and laid in bed. So I ended up spending uh, most of March, uh, the end of March, all of April, and all of May in my bedroom. And the only exceptions were to get up and go for, for, for treatment in March and April. And um, so that was not fun. Um, but it was during that time where, I'll tell you, I got reconnected with the personal one-on-one -on -one intimacy with the Lord. Um, he just draws near when you're crushed, when you can't do anything to help yourself. He's there in ways that he isn't when you have your vitality. One of the things strength. that you shared with me, you just said that there was just times where you just lay in there, couldn't even really do anything. You just lay in there, but you had such a sense of Jesus just laying there with you. Yeah. I mean, it sounds a like little... that's... I mean, dude. It, it, it was literally the only time in my Christian experience where I felt like... I've had moments where Jesus is very tender with me. But I haven't had back-to-back -back week, week, week for six weeks where I literally, you know, he wasn't there physically in his body, but I literally felt like the Lord just got under the covers with me and just laid there with me and, um, and just fellowshiped with me in my pain and my, uh, my isolation. And so I'll say this, but I don't want to sound super spiritual, but the whole process, I would not ask God to turn back the clock and not let me go through it. I needed it in so many ways, even though, um, you know, physically it was a mess. So the, the byproduct of it, and this will wrap up the physical part, the, the byproduct is that um, because of the massive amount of radiation that, that fixates right here, um, it, they fixated from this side of my face over and primarily in the tumorous area, um, it burns out all of your mucous membranes in your mouth, in your throat. And so you can't produce saliva and you, and you have no moisture in your throat, so you can't eat. And so the, the most maddening thing for me, I began to lose my taste in the second week of radiation, but I was still, you know, I still had enough saliva where I was able to, you know, I couldn't taste anything, but I was still eating. But April 21st was the last meal that I had, and I still <laughs> haven't had a meal since then. <laughs> so April 20th, I've had bites of food. I had this wonderful, I'll call it the spaghetti breakthrough, where like, I guess three, four weeks after treatment, I said, we're going to go and I'm going to eat some spaghetti. And so I took my family to a little restaurant down the street, and I had 10 bites of spaghetti. Felt like, you know, greatest American hero. It was awesome. <laughs> Uh, and I thought that was going to be my breakthrough, but it hasn't turned out to be. So um, I've lost, obviously, you know, if you ever want to lose weight, I can tell you how to do oh it. My. I can tell you how to do it. You don't want to do it this way, but I can tell you no. it works. But uh, I'm down 53 pounds from this time last year. Incredible. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, when I get my taste buds and my throat back in conjunction, get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> I have a list of things that I'm going to. I'm going to tackle, so we can't wait to do that. And but. I mean, you know, just us communicating, we've communicated every week, basically texts, you know, and as you were, as you were going through the thing where you were losing the ability to s swallow, 
I was just like my brother. I mean, I was, I just, I just couldn't conceive of how that was just physically, just the yeah. challenge of that. And, you know, man, I've, I'm, I'm even hearing you tell, I've heard you obviously say this now 10 times, but just hearing you again, it's like, dude, I just, all I could say is you're a tough guy, man. Well, and I'm we, sorry. <laughs> I love you. And you're here now. Praise God. Yeah, and it's I'm, getting better. That's the thing I asked, yeah. you, I asked you Monday. I said, so can you tell it's physically changing? Yeah, absolutely. So the, you know, the worst of it, the, you know, you hit this peak of where it's optimum pain, optimum inabilities and all of that. I was taking six hot showers a day because it was the only thing that made me feel physically alive. It brought, you know, it felt good. And so I was taking six hot showers a day. Um, thank you, Travis Martin, for making me an awesome shower a year before <laughs> all this hit. It became my sanctuary. Um, but then, um, you know, you start turning the corner, Amy and Alicia uh, taking care of me. There just really wasn't a whole lot to do. But yes, at this point, I'm, I'm physically world's better. I'm, I'm still only operating probably, I found this out yesterday, it was Landon's birthday, and I wanted to do something dad sonish with him. And so I, he, he's playing basketball, and I told him I'd rebound for him at a local court. And uh, it, it wiped me out completely. So I'm still only at about 50% capacity. You told me it was like 45 minutes worth, and you were about... Yeah, I, I, he, Landon was being generous. I think it was more like 30 minutes. He's like, no, Dad, you made it 45. And I was like... Probably not, but thank you, son. I'll take that. And uh, I just had to go sit in the car. And, you know, those things are humbling. You know, you want to be out there with your 15-year-old, but your body's just saying, no, that's all you can take. But um, so physically, not where I need to be, but not sick. And so that's awesome. So And officially, we're breaking the rules right now. Totally breaking the rules. Like my doctors, I'm not supposed to be out and about. This is my COVID barrier, I guess, with Alicia. <laughs> I have a pillow here. <laughs> like, that's going to prevent, but... Um, I just, you get to the point where it's like, get me out of the house. I, I can't, I can't stay in the house anymore. So I've been by my pool. I just literally, thank God we built that pool for Amy's physical needs, uh, a few years ago so she could exercise with her injuries. And now when I finally got to get out of the house, all I would do, there were days, literally I would go and sit with my head on the table for 15 minutes in the backyard. And that was like paradise for me. But now I'm able to just kind of sit out there for an hour at a time. So yeah. I feel alive again. That's awesome. And because I, I can even tell, like, I think the first time I saw you was maybe three and a half, four weeks ago now. Probably. Uh, th yeah, three and a half weeks ago when I was over there visiting. And, um, you know, even today, there's an obvious, you're way different than you were even then. You're yeah. just like coming out of the cave at that point. I sent I sent you the picture before I started chemo. It was like, ha ha. I sent you the picture of Gollum. Remember the picture of Gollum from Lord of the Rings? I said, yeah. hey, pray I don't end up looking like I this know. guy. And then, and then at the <laughs> peak, of, at the peak, you sent me that. I, I sent an like, actual picture of oh, me, God. and I'm like, dude, I'm so close to Gollum <laughs> level right now. But the Lord's been good, and I, I really do. I thank Him. I, I, um, I, I want instant healing. That's what we always go That's for. I, 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 I want instant healing, and. Um, the instant miraculous healing didn't happen, but I have learned that he is wise. And even in the delays um, from going from where I was to where I am, and it's taken a process, he's just, he's such a close companion and faithful instructor. And there's way more to this whole battle with cancer season, way more than just Jeff got sick, now Jeff is better. There's mm -hmm. just so much training and teaching and just intimacy he's tearing things out of me that i didn't know were there uh, spiritually he is giving me things that have been either dormant or never been there and so that's why i said earlier not to sound you know, yeah. super christian but i i would not i would not go back in time and miss this yeah no and I, that was something that you'd said to me a couple of times is just that the the dynamics and, and the thing you know let's just be clear and you, cause you said this to me five times and we're kind of taking it for granted cause we're just chatting, but you're like, yeah, I know for sure. God didn't give me cancer. Right. You know? yeah, I want to make sure people know that I don't believe in a heavenly father that smites his kids with cancer arbitrarily, but there's also the theological tension where he's he, sovereign. he's sovereign and he didn't prevent it. 
And so when you look at throughout Bible history, you see just Job, for instance. God can stop these things, but when God, God sometimes will harness what he hates in order to bring about what he loves. Mm. And so he hates cancer. He hates sickness. He hates all of that, but he will harness that because that's part of us living in the sin-cursed world. He'll harness it in order to bring about something that he loves. And I think what he loves is he loves for his children to be as close to him as possible. Yeah. And um, so I, I would say this, the devil's, the devil's in trouble for doing it, but God's going to take what was meant for evil and, and turn it for good. And I don't remember what Sunday it was, but there was a Sunday we had Amy. I think it was right after the surgery and she got up, dude, and I want to rewatch it, but she prophesied for about five minutes. I mean, it was like the spirit of the Lord came on her. First, she just started giving like an encouragement. We're going to make it, you know, things like that. But the spirit of the Lord came on her. And she started prophesying about how God was going to bring breakthrough and God was going to show himself strong and that the, you know, sort of the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the glory of the former. And she was just prophesying. I mean, she just slipped into the spirit of prophecy and it was power. I was up here shaking as she was declaring. And I, I want to go back and watch it because I believe that's, that's what's ahead. I believe that's what, what God you know, it's like he's like you said, he's not doing it, but he's harnessing something yeah. to create something beautiful. And so I, I I fully believe that that what you know, what the devil meant for bad, God is turning tur- turning around for awesome. Yeah. So well, what do you what do you feel like right now? Like what is the next, you know, season look like for you guys? I mean, you and I have talked a ton and mm-hmm. you know just even candidly, even today, just going back over the last 20, this is 23 years of ministry. 23 years of vocational pastoral ministry, yeah. And so what do you feel like, you know, the days ahead look like for you? And I know you don't, you don't even get medically cleared till August. Yeah, sometime in August. So the next stage is people want to know, are you, are you cancer free? I'll tell you this, I, I feel fine in that sense. I'm weak, but I don't feel sick at all anymore. I want a chicken enchilada real bad because I'm really, you know, just wanting to eat. But Release that, it, Lord. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I go back uh, August. Uh, interestingly enough, it's my spiritual birthday. It's August 4th. I go back for my scans, um, and then I'll do a con- consultation on August 5th, and they'll tell me, uh, I believe they're going to tell me I'm clear. Yeah. Um, but we have to go, again, through that medical process. So the earliest I would be cleared uh, – of the cancer saying, okay, you're, you're free. We'll see you every six months, nine months, 12 months, whatever they do. Uh, that would be in early August. So until then I'm on, I'm on medical restrictions. Like we said it earlier, I'm not even supposed to be here. Um, Beca- and because of the COVID thing, it COVID, compounds everything. Yeah. I can't, I can't be in large gatherings. Um, I can't be, I I'm, I'm in that, that upper echelon or lower echelon, however you want to say it of, um, high risk, risk yeah. yeah, high risk is what I was going to say. And so they don't want me out and about. So I won't, I won't be here. Um, I won't be in our gatherings. Um, I'll continue to have to interact virtually, um, at least for the next couple of months. Um, and then, um, when we think of 23 years, uh, for those that I don't know, or you don't know the story, uh, I started as a lead pastor at what was then Meadow, Meadow, um, and that was in 02. And so from 02 up until about 2016, the context for my ministry was reformation, meaning transitioning a very traditional denominational church into a New Testament church. And anytime you do that, reformation work means at times war because you're messing with people's cultural idols, their religious idols, their traditional idols. You're doing it in love, but you're having to do it firmly because you're wanting to press into truth. And so the whole context for my ministry for multiple, multiple, multiple years, over a decade, was battle. And I became, and people would say it, they'd prophesy it, but they'd also say it, and they'd be like, man, you're born for war. You're a Joshua, you're born for war. And I I just kind of said, well, I don't know about that, but I, I'm warring. I have to do it. And so what, what I realized, and I only realized this really during laying in bed, recovering from cancer, is that warring spirit um, 
became so predominant in me that even when there wasn't a war, I'm walking around with a fighting spirit. And wherever I'm going, I'm carrying that. And so when it's, it's great. If there's a war, great, be a fighter. But w- when you're going home, you don't need a fighting spirit on you. When you're having lunch with a friend, you don't need a fighting spirit on you. When you're, when you're interacting with people on your team, you don't need a fighting spirit on you. But what had happened is I had, I had kind of imbibed that. And it wasn't all the time, but it was enough to where at times um, it, it was just really thick on me. And so, you know, during these years, we, we went through all of the reformation of the church. We transitioned theologically. We transitioned philosophically, methodologically. We were doing things different. And all of that kind of hammering war spirit, uh, I think it just kind of gave me, I don't think I know it, it just gave me a, a heavy spirit where I was always assuming there was a fight. And so what that did is that, you know, it, it, it didn't make me the most approachable person in the world. And um, ultimately, um, it, it became at times unprofitable. And so, and it wearied me. I think that's probably the, the heaviest thing is you can't fight for 23 years. You can't do that. And I wasn't getting any breaks. I take a vacation, family vacation. And just, I mean, con- you know, context. You, I mean, you and I were talking today and you broke it down for me in a way that like it even made it more vivid to me. And I know your story real well, but I mean, when you, when you take over, you take over in the middle of a church crisis. Correct. That was an O2. Yeah. And then from there, I mean, can you just give a little bit, I'm not trying to undignify anybody, but no, well, I became pastor on the back end of a little bit of a, a troubling season for our church. Um, and they made me the, the lead pastor. And then we immediately started transitioning, as I mentioned earlier, just trying to become a New Testament church. Um, we relocated to this building from Duluth, that building, and that was in 08, and that building down there, uh, the, the real estate market crashed. We couldn't sell the building. That brought financial stress on us for about two years. Um, so I'm dealing with that. I'm dealing with church stuff. Then we're, we went through probably one large and two smaller church splits over various issues. Um, in the middle of all of that, the worst thing that's ever happened to our family was that Amy was in a horrific collision, as most of you know, an auto collision where a man crossed the center line, hit her head on. My precious mother-in-law, who was the passenger, died in that wreck. Amy was in the hospital for forever. and Supposed to not walk again. Supposed to not walk again. They thought they'd have to amputate. And so then we had rehab with her. So that blew our lives up. It deeply affected my children whose whole life their mom all died and then mom was gone and dad had to take care of mom and you know it's just trauma and so all that was happening then when Amy starts getting better that's when the church splits started happening and then we moved from the church splits into church mergers and so if you write that down and you hand that to you know any any counselor or anything that Especially any consultant would look at that and say what yeah it's just a heavy load and what I didn't realize is that you know, it was wearing and tearing on my spirit, on my mind, on my family. Um, Amy saw it in the family way before I did and at a level that I wasn't seeing it. And so what's happened, and then, of course, you tag all of this with, okay, now I've got cancer and spending, you know, m- months down. Can't minister, can't serve, can't preach, can't write, can't, just can't do all the things that are good things, but those were the things that I kept giving my attention to and other things I, that I should have been seeing, I wasn't. And so um, I think as, we, or as, as we're looking for the rest of 2020, because we've got two preachers here and I'm, I'm uh-huh. rambling a little bit, but the, the medical sabbatical that just circumstances placed me on, that's going through August anyway. And then in talking with our leadership teams here, talking with Amy, Amy being a part of those discussions, talking with my children, um, we've come to the conclusion that for the rest of 2020, I'm going to be pulling back completely from all forms of ministry. And so um, I will not be actively in my role. I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not disappearing or anything. I'm, I haven't been fired or I'm not resigning or anything like that. It's, it's I'm not, not sure any, you it, can get fired. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's not an issue of, of that. It's an issue of, okay, while I'm laying in bed and I've got nothing but time with fellowshipping with the Lord. And, you know, Psalm 119, verse 67 and verse 71 are the defining verses for this season for me. Psalm 119, verse 67 and 71. And they say the same thing, basically. They say, before I was afflicted, I went astray. And then the second one says, it is good for me that I was afflicted, for you've, made, you've caused me to know your statutes. And you put those two verses together, and what you find is this biblical principle of that. And then you've got 1 Peter 4, 1. That's the New Testament verse that says, um, he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from, from sin. sin. And so I don't want you panicking or anything. I wasn't off in immorality or anything like that. But sin is not just, you know, breaking moral codes. Sin is when you're not pursuing the Lord as the foremost love of your life and you're pursuing other things or distracted by other things. And that's where I was. And so the affliction has brought me to a place where when you're laying in bed and the Lord's like, hey, you've been really busy and you haven't been listening to me. So I'm going to get in this bed with you for about two and a half months and I'm just going to love on you and I'm going to tell you who you are and I'm going to remind you who I am mm -hmm. and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you see some of these changes that need to happen. So we've agreed as a leadership team, you know this, yeah. but just by sake of announcement that um, the best thing for me, the best thing for my family, um, which will ultimately be the best thing for my spiritual family yeah. and the roles that I have, is for me to take the remainder of 2020 off and um, get better physically. Um, I will need the whole year before I get physically capable yeah. to do what I need to do. But it's not so much about the physical as it is about relational and just getting recentered in the Lord. I figure I'm, I just turned 50, so I've got, let's just say I got 20 years. I want them to be the most Christ centered. Sorry, I'm going to get choked up. No, it's good. I want to. Uh, I want Jesus as close to me in what comes next as he was to me in the bed during those months. And I want to be the best husband Amy can have. And Alicia's an adult and Landon, you know, is halfway through high school. I want them to have the dad that they deserve. And so we're going to work uh, for the next several months very intentionally in my home towards those purposes and um, fortunately we have such capable leaders here that it's the only time in those 23 years that I could actually conceive of doing this I never could have done this before this season and so that's what we're going to do um, I'm not going to be active in any capacity in ministry a lot of you would know I'm very active on social media with kingdom stuff. I'm completely going to be pulling out of social media. I have for the most part already anyway. Um, I won't be doing any ministry. If I'm in the building here or at the prayer room, I'm there because I'm, I'm just pursuing the Lord. And that's, that's an important point just for the spiritual family to, to embrace that. Cause, and we've talked about this. We have a, a value for rest and for sabbatical. Because you and I have examples, as long as our arm, of men who, you know, gave it all for the ministry, lost their family, lost their sanity. And, and so we, we believe in that Sabbath rest. And in environments like what you've been in for 23 years, there hasn't been that opportunity to take those times. I mean, a vacation here and there, but it literally has been hammer blow after hammer blow and you've been to the task you've been able to the task but to me it's like the idea that a pastor should just stay on task and go 30 years without, without ever saying break that's ludicrous that's just ludicrous you know professors in college do it doctors do it lawyers do it so many professionals in so many other environments take every 10 years they'll take a six month season to reset and in the ministry, it's almost like, no, pastor, you can't. Yeah. And it's like, that's just, it's just not realistic because well, we're not built for that. Well, I think in earlier years, there would have been a lot of pride slash guilt slash shame because you, the pastor is supposed to be the, the dude. He's not supposed to need rest. And then, of course, you, you know, you look at Jesus Christ in the Gospels, <laughs> and there are multiple occasions. One says he was wearied. 
You know, he, woman, woman sat, sat down at the well. That's where he met the woman at the well. Other times it said he left the crowds and got apart with either just himself and the father or his disciples. And so, you know, the example is pretty clear that um, nobody can, can just continue to go on and on yeah. like that. And, and I'm grateful for our leadership team. Of course, I've been out of the picture for months. Um, and to, you know, COVID, I have to say this. I'm so glad I haven't had to lead during COVID. <laughs> I, so, I so thank the Lord for you guys that have, have held down the floor. I told Amy, I was like, I almost feel like the timing of this cancer was just, you know, perfect. Because I, I don't know how Is y'all done such it. A thing? It's just been crazy. Well, our media guys, I was telling you before, I mean, our media guys have been crazy. Matthew Pennington, the whole crew has been, they've been amazing. Shelly, marketing, Becca, Jen, all the administrative people in the office taking care of communications, Hazen, Dustin, those guys have been fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's- I feel like that too. Like, I'm like, we're in good hands. Like those, everybody that I just named, plus there's 10 more behind each of them, they're carrying us and it's been amazing. Well, and I, you know, I think that brings me a great deal because I'm not the dude who loves the sidelines. I can't stand just hanging out and just not doing anything. But this sabbatical is not a vacation. This is not about me, you know, sitting, I'm not going to be sitting by the pool in October. You know, this is going to be very proactive of me investing and, uh, you know, putting some relational repair work um, in multiple areas and then tending to my own heart so that I never get back to the place that I was at right before I I got the cancer. And so, um, you know, just for clarity's sake, uh, I'm not going to be writing and blogging. I, I head up another ministry called Transforming Truth, and I'm working with our technical producer, Josh Frost, and we're going to be lining up messages that will go on TV, but I'm not going to be doing I'm not going to be ministering. I'm, I'm going to be completely pulling back from leadership, and I'm going to be a son of the Lord. I'm going to be a husband to Amy. I'm going to be a father to Alicia and Landon, and then a friend to a very small group of people who'll be speaking to my life at that time. But I will be back. Yeah. And so I, I want to say this, to, especially to our church family, because the hardest part of all of this being gone has been I'm, I'm detached from my spiritual family. Yeah. And I miss everybody terribly. But I don't, I don't want to be that statistic that you mentioned of guys that implode in multiple ways, and some of them horrific, that have made the news this year. I'm not going to be that guy. And so no. in order to do that, I've got to pull back, trust the Lord with all of my duties and other people are going to be doing, and then take care of myself and my family, and then come back at the appro- appropriate time yeah. and serve better, um, be a better brother to my sisters and my brothers, and come back and be, instead of a carrier of war, I want to carry kindness. I want to carry joy. I want to carry some of these components of the fruit of the Spirit that I have assumed or presumed upon and not spent time partnering with the Lord and cultivating the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, the, the softer side of who the Lord is. Yeah. And at the same time, if wars have come about, you know, battles come about, we're living in a very intense season of conflict in our nation, and the church is not immune from that. I know, I know how to fight, but I want to know how to fight the right way. You remember, um, before? I think it was even before the surgery, um, I said, you know, man, I, I've been praying so much. I don't, I don't have a lot from the Lord, but I think I've got this one word. And I said, I felt like the Lord told me he was going to change you from a fighter to a lover. Yep. And um, yeah, I feel like, I mean, that's what's happening. So. Yeah, I, I, I definitely remember that. That was, <laughs> that was one of the little stakes that the Lord drove in the ground because that word had a prophetic weight to it. And... Um, it will take the Holy Spirit 
changing my heart because some people love naturally and easily and fluidly. I call Amy the love gusher because she just loves, man. That woman knows how to love. <laughs> I didn't learn it as a kid. I didn't have it modeled for me. And so I'm, I'm late to the game in this, but I'm, I'm tired of just assuming it's a personality quirk. I'm like, no, the fruit of the spirit, the Holy Spirit. You can talk in tongues all day long and prophesy and raise the dead, but man, if you can't love... 1 Corinthians 13, what good is all of that stuff? So good. Well, man, I, I just love you. I'm committed to you and your family, Dustin, our whole leadership team is. Yeah. And I think we all feel like this is so good and so right for you guys right now. And I think there's, there's a physical health, but there's a, a family wholeness yeah. that you're going for that I think is right. It's the Lord, and it's good. And so just... To the spiritual family, I would just say we've been in a mode where we've been giving the Lyles room as they go through the cancer side of challenge. And we're just going to continue to keep that kind of bubble. You know, we're just going to keep that where we're not looking to them for the counseling. We're not, you know, when, when Jeff and Amy show up in a service, let's not run over and ask, can you pray for me? You know, let's not just let them be human beings for a minute. That's just right. And, um, I've told you and Amy multiple times that I am committed to you. I know it too. I believe it. And, um, and this is going to be an awesome season, man. It is. It's going to be an awesome season. And I just, I just believe when Amy was prophesying that day, she was speaking the future. And, uh, and so whatever, whatever we get to do in this season while you guys are in this mode of sabbatical, whatever we get to do to serve that by serving the family here, it's an honor, man. It's an honor to stand with you, Jeff. It's an honor to serve your family. Yeah, I feel it, and I'm, I'm grateful. I, I don't have the proper words, but, um, you know, my, my intention is to, I, I never, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not looking for anything other than breakthrough here that leads to further breakthroughs here. And so for the rest of the calendar year, um, it's just going to be about becoming healthy in every sense of the word. It's awesome. And uh, I'll pop in here from time to time. It'll be it'll be challenging to be in the room. And I saw you tonight when you came walking through. You're like, I haven't been here in a few months. You're like, your eyes were lighting up. It's just, it's. I, I love, I love what's happened here over the last many many years and what's happening here now. So it's hard not to be here. Uh, folks will see Amy and the kids here more often than me because especially for the next two months, I can't be here at all. But um, yeah, let's just play it by ear. And uh, I mean, it sounds so cliche now, but it's my book title. It's figuring it out as I go. <laughs> it's, that's exactly, I'm still it figuring it out. It to be prophetic. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else you want to share, just add or? I don't think so. I just, I just want to say that um, I'm, I'm just... I think more than anything right now, what I sense is I just sense um, a Kairos moment. And that's just a moment that this is a season. It's a God-defined season where he's being intentional with me in specific ways that I don't have answers for. Um, if you ask me, give me some details, I'd be like... Eh, you just I, got them. Yeah. I mean, I, the details that I know are the next six months are <clears throat> about an adventure in healing and uh, with the Lord and with my family. And so um, I, I would say to the family, the spiritual family of Newbridge and IHOP Atlanta, um, let's keep pressing in. I may not be physically yeah. among, but man, this is, this is the most beautifully volatile season. When I say beautifully, it just means it's volatile. Nobody's denying that. But the beauty of the Lord's gonna manifest in this season that we're in. And um, I don't expect the intensity to dissipate. I actually expect intensity to go up this calendar year culturally. And what an opportunity for us to all press in together. Yeah. Together. And what we share in Christ is everlasting. And I don't give a rip how anybody votes in November. That's none of my business. I'm the, I will never let that divide. And this, the political stuff and the cultural stuff and the racial stuff... It's, it's all a testing season for us to hold on to our kingdom citizenship yeah. together yeah. and let that be the identifying mark in us. And it, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm, 
you know, my goal is to be back uh, early 2021 and I'll be healthier and I, I want our spiritual family uh, to be healthy. Yeah, I believe that. Awesome. Well, we're, let's just wrap it up. Would you just pray? Just yeah. close this out, man. Sure. I love you, bud. Love you. Thanks for letting me come tonight and love everybody out there. And uh, we shall reconnect. Let's pray. We belong to you. We're yours. That's our center. That's our anchor. That's the only thing we, we really, really know for sure. It's certain. It's we belong to you. You've made us your own. Jesus, thank you for securing us with your blood. There is now, therefore now, no condemnation. Yes, yes. That we are yours. And Lord, we're yours together, which means we belong to each other too. So I thank you, Lord, for not only my local spiritual family, but for the broader family, for the bride, for the church, the Big C Church. I thank you, Lord, for your grace to each and every one of us. I thank you, God, I thank you that when an affliction is called for to bring future strength, that you don't shy away from allowing affliction. I thank you for harnessing what you hate in order to bring about what you love. Yes. That there is nothing that is beyond your disposal. That you'll take the worst that the enemy can hurl at us, you'll catch it in hands of omnipotence, and you will turn it back around on him to where he'll eventually regret that he ever messed with us. So, Lord, for Newbridge, IHOP, Atlanta, for the next six plus months, God, it's my joy just as an under shepherd to be able to step aside for a little bit, to learn how to be a son again and not so much as a servant or a leader, but just to learn how to be a son. So let the spirit of wisdom and revelation be on the, the leadership team here. For Billy and Dustin, especially as they pastor, shepherd, cast vision for all of the other leaders and all of those that serve in, in the places that aren't under the spotlight. Wisdom, strength, protection, provision. God, let an anointing come on this house that we've never seen before. Let it come upon the prayer room. Holy Spirit, move in ways that we would not have seen had it not been through going through these fires together. Yes. And Lord, I do. I pray for our nation right now. I do not ask you to calm things down or return them to the previous version of normal. I ask you to work all things according to the counsel yes. of your will. Oh, yes. and what must be broken must be broken. What must be built must be built. But I ask God that you will not leave us in the shallows as your people anymore. And if it takes the fires in the culture raging, then Lord, do it to purify your church. Jesus. We love you, Son of God. We long for your return. I pray anybody watching or listening to this right now, Lord, that doesn't know you, doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord, that they would feel the fear of God as they simultaneously feel the invitation of God saying, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest because you're yes. the rest-giving God yes. in whom we trust. In Jesus' name, amen.